very interesting conversations with each other, so I'm going to interrupt them. But um, it's after 9 30, so I think we should begin. What a lovely way to begin a Sunday morning. All you smiling, eager faces. Um, this session is called Getting to the Heart of the Story. My name is Philip Campbell, I'm a producer. Um, and I also do development work in film and in theatre as well. Um, so, to the heart of the story, or a story is something that I've been involved with for many years and fascinated by. Um, I'm delighted to be here with Dana this morning. She's going to take us on a really interesting journey, I'm sure. But just to introduce a session which is sponsored by WIFT. Susie's going to say a few words. Come on, I know it, come on, for Awaroa Te Wai, for Rainbow Warrior Te Waka, for Nati Argentina Te Iwi, for Susie Newborn Aho. Can I go to Tenakoto? My name is Susie Newborn. I'm the executive director of Women in Film and Television, and it's a great honor for me to be hosting this session, for us to be hosting this session today with Dan and Philippa. Women in Film and Television is the largest organization of its kind in the country. We're a pan-industry association. We represent women, and now more and more men, from uh, different walks of life in the industry. Per capita, we're the largest industry of its kind in the world. If you see one of these blue pamphlets, brochures around, and you want to join up, please do. This month alone, we've had almost half a dozen men join our organization, which is fantastic. We have professional development events in all three main centers. Every month, networking events. We collaborate with other girls. We put out a newsletter, and so on and so on. There are two posters in my office that I look at every day and which inspire me, as well as all the posters of all the films that all our members have made. And one is one that says, in the United States of America, 4% of people in film who work in film are women. Now, in New Zealand, it's 6 to 9%. In Iran, it's 25%. The other poster is, one from my, I was a previous uh, campaign of the Oxfam, and it says, the hand that rocks the cradle must also rock the boat. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll present you Dan. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's um, speaking about the heart of a story cannot take us to a very structured way of speaking, right? We, we immediately enter to a very subjective and emotional territory, and from there we're gonna we're gonna talk. And please feel free to just jump in the conversation anytime you want. It's not you know I speak and then we wait for questions and answers. Just let's let's try to make it as dynamic as, as we can. Um, I guess that, you know, there are two things that I, we could start this conversation from many places, right? And um, I have like a few things in my head that I would like to put out, which is one, we all as filmmakers or storytellers are haunted by the fear on how, what do we need in order to make a film that will succeed? Right? That is what we all want. And the first thing that I always ask myself is where I place the concept of success in my personal territory. And from there, I can only speak. I cannot say, you know, in terms of the industry. I believe, first of all, in my presence as a unique individual. And from there, I can participate in an industry. So for me to think on what is the, what is, what, what can make a story successful is 
if it's a story that can make me feel as an audience that I want to change the world, that it's going to move me in such a way that when I go out of the cinema, I become a different human being from any place, from my guts, from my heart, from my brains. If the story hits me in any of those places, then I feel that my deal happened as, as audience. So I always place myself first as an audience when I start thinking on my story. And the only place from where I can speak is from my heart, because it's the only thing that will make me a unique storyteller. We are, um, we are going through in the last 20 years to, you know, trying to survive this horrible concept of globalization that has, uh, that I see it like a, like a horrible virus through which we all have to be the same. And we all have to relate to the same kind of storytelling and structures. And we are losing in terms of accommodating the demands of the market, the market that is being globalized, we, we have been losing the uniqueness of our identity as a cultural group sometimes and as an individual mainly. So I do start from the place of who I am and what is really crucially important for me. Every story in, in, in my experience in the films that I made, and probably that's why I haven't made so many, because they really take a huge part of my life, it becomes almost like an exorcism through which I go really, really deeply into the matter that is important for me in that, uh, you know, in a specific story. Yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I would, I would call, you know, for me the call is let's try not to lose who we are. So we are, I'm yes, sorry, yes, yes, yes. That because this is, this is absolutely a question that I've been asking of Cinogram China and yeah. meeting a bunch of well known artists, uh, animators, and cartoonists from all over the world. And this is a question that I'm putting to them too. So, previously, we had you know, a particular identity and integrity which came through culture because of isolation, you know, because we couldn't. Communicate so Here well. in New Zealand, I mean. I mean, everywhere in the world. Okay. Specificity with yes. and identity because of because we're all different people all talking together, and therefore we become different. Yeah. So now yeah. we've got the internet. We can communicate really easily, and we can take on influences from everywhere. So it's not a, it's not isolation that's creating our personal identity anymore. So what are, so what are ways that we can yeah, like how do we how do we then develop the specificity and the the culture? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what Dana just to go back into this your stream, mm. beginning very much with you and you as an individual and your thinking and feeling. Yeah. Um, can we just stay there for yeah. a bit, Alex? But you know, I think yes, yes, Eva. Because I think that that. Will you, out of that will come some thoughts about how that might be shared and how that yes, might right. yes. translate. And, and you know something, I do think that that is it, it's a very specific point that, that is important to bring out. They are like the, the two fundamental U's, you know, like a letter, letter U, which is uniqueness, mm. can take you to universality. Mm. Mm. You know, so I believe, yes, we are bombarded with all this facility to become part of a cyber identity where we can all be the same and we can all enrich ourselves from others. But if you lose touch with the uniqueness of your individuality in order to accommodate yourself, I believe that you lose your identity. And your, your, your uniqueness is, is, is fed, is nurtured by your culture, your geography, the stories that you heard when you were a kid, the stories that you've seen in the cinema that have, that, you know, all what makes you the you that, you know, the person that you are and is nurtured from your roots and the rest of the world. Yeah. But for the younger generation, what the things that they get in their childhood mm -hmm. is the rest of the world. It is. It is. And you know, from that place, if we go to a very general 
territory, you know, as, in my case, as a mother, that's my duty, to keep on feeding to my child the uniqueness of her origins. And you know, that's an individual job that doesn't, that doesn't affect only cinema, it's almost like a political presence in your everyday life. If you feed your child or your people around you with the reminder of who they come, where they come from and who they are, they shouldn't get lost. Mm. So how did you find your first story? My first first story that I that made, you made publicly. It's, it was a documentary film, and it was a, it was a story of a woman in Mexico, and she was accused of killing all her children, and she was a woman who was who had all the social, ideological, and cultural handicaps that you could find in the Mexican society. She was an indigenous woman, unemployed. She didn't know how to read and write, mm -hmm. and she was a solo mother. And those were, you know, when I, when I questioned, when I read that piece of news in the, in the papers, I wondered, well, what would be happening here? Mm. And it was not that I had the answer. It was not me trying to make an essay of a modern Mexican Medea. It was me trying to question myself through my work and question my society what would bring that, that tragedy as an option for a woman? What would be, which, where were, which were the social or emotional or personal conditions that would push a mother to kill her children? Right. Yeah. yeah. And of course, through the process of doing that documentary, I think that the, the key for me was the fact that I didn't have any certainties at all. I went through the documentary with all the questions I could have, but no, I didn't take any answers pre-established. And what I discovered was totally, of course, a different story. It was a story of an abusive man who used to be an ex-policeman, hunger, you know, a, a totally different story that you would read in the paper. So for me, it was important to know why, why someone, which would be the conditions in, in a society to push a human being to kill their children in order to survive, which is a terrible mm. contradiction, mm. right? For me, at the time, and it still is, was a major concern. It is still a major concern on justice, hunger, you know, pushing, the, taking away from every human being their most basic rights what happens with you as an individual. You know, we have essays mm. in political studies of, of uh, poverty, but how it touches the individual, the human being, that was a little bit the story of that first story. And how, how as a filmmaker can you explore those questions or ask those questions, which is different from a journalist or a sociologist or a psychologist or, you know, I, other forms of communication? I think that what's again... The, what's the special thing for you as a filmmaker? It would, it would work in different ways when you work as a, in a documentary film and in a, in a fiction film, yeah. right? When you're, when you're doing a documentary film, I think that for me, the key was exactly that, not to have, not to pretend to go and prove my thesis. I was not going with any pre-established agenda. I was going with all the possible questions. I was searching. But you had chosen her story. I did choose her story, and I said, okay, from here, yeah. what am I gonna find out? Yeah. And the story of that film is exactly that. What I found out through this horrible nightmare. And what I found out was the absolute corruption and toxicity of the Mexican justice system, for example, mm. which was far away from what I thought that I, would, that I was going to find. So you were surprised along the way? I was surprised that that became the real issue of the film. Right. Yeah. Me being familiar with my country, I know that the justice system is absolutely a catastrophe. Mm. But seeing it happening in the, in, in the, through a human being, a specific mother, it really brought like a totally different dimension, which, has, which was, again, an emotional dimension. It mm. was not, a, it, it, it was not a, yeah, it went directly through the emotional side of that tragedy. 
in the social and political context of my country. Yeah. Um, Dana, just picking up what you said, you know how you talked about, you framed, you said what interested you is what kind of social condition would produce a tragedy like this, yes. right? Which is a different question than somebody who might have gone, what kind of person is capable of an evil thing? So in a way, even in, in, in that open-ended question that one asks, is one own kind of social, like ideological position, right? Yes. That, that, you, that what drew you to it was the larger issues that sur surrounded it as against this particular woman and her life. So uh, isn't that part of what, isn't that in a way kind of, that yes, it's from the heart, but our framework is our, is our political <coughs> framework because politics is both personal and big P? It is. It is, and yes, but, but I do believe that us as individuals are political entities. I do think that it's a major choice. I don't, you know, from my, that is my choice. I don't want to say this is the way, this is not right. My choice as an individual is to assume the right that I have to be a political entity. And from that place, I speak in my films. And I start to know again, when I go and sit of, to watch a film, because before anything, I'm a viewer. I'm a passionate viewer. I, I love films. I've always loved watching films. And if I, if I expect a film to change me as a viewer, I do try. You never know what's going to happen, but I try when I make a film that someone out there in, in, in the vastness of the audience, somebody will change through the story that I tell. And that is a political action. And, yeah. Um, Dani, you're talking about the um, documentary approaching it in a very open-ended, it's far too late. Do you take that same approach with your feature films? Or do you have a more, you know, a stronger idea from the start of really what you're setting out to say? Or is it something that you discover on the way? You know something, I, I, I find that when, when I've been working in fiction, in the same way that I'm, I'm, I'm embarking myself, there was a beautiful anecdote that I was telling Philippe a couple of days ago about the first, my first day in film school, centuries ago. And my teacher, a beautiful, beautiful teacher, which we call him the dog, he said, um, he said, we filmmakers, we storytellers are pirates. Now the word pirate is associated or on stealing rights in films. Centuries ago, it was still a romantic archetype. And he said, well, we, are, we have to become pirates and grab a ship and go in the search of a treasure. And in that journey, you will find sea monsters and seducing mermaids, and you will have to defeat the cannons of the armada it doesn't matter how rough and terrible the sea and the journey will be, you have to get to the island with your map. So can you tell us a little bit? Hang on, just, just, just oh, keep, let you keep going. And then you know. you can ask just tell you the, little, the end of the story. And you know, the fact that you go to the, to the island doesn't mean that you will find the treasure. <laughs> but you have to go there. And in order to go to that island, you have to be brave and you have to absolutely blindly believe and that you're an outcast, you're an outlaw, everything is in your side, you can do anything in order to get to that island, find the treasure and bring it back. And you only bring it back when it's on the screen. And you can only make sure that the treasure happens when the people in the cinema are overtaken by your story. Going to your question, Diane, I do believe that that is a journey as a fiction storyteller. You know, I do have, I, I search, I have questions. And they go directly through my internal system, but it's a place, it's a universe in which I am the captain of my ship. Mm. I am the pirate and I have my map. When we are dealing, or when I am dealing with documentaries, which hasn't happened many times, but when I happen to have the privilege, because it has been a privilege to work in documentary films, I almost submit my ignorance to the intensity and the complexity and, and the fascination of reality. 
And then I, it brings another question, which is, well, reality becomes, again, an exercise of the subjective mind. So where is the place of a documentary filmmaker in terms of a reality that is different to all of us? I believe that it's in placing a question. You go asking questions instead of imposing <coughs> your point of views in the world and trying to prove them through the film. In fiction, I do have my map. We'll get to the map in a minute. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you about how you draw your maps and how you mm. put them together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I was going to so, ask, and, um, I wanted to know what the process was that you worked through to get to the heart of the story. Specifically. Mm. Well, you know, it depends. And I usually am more comfortably and more happy work through adapting. You know, it happens to me in a much, much easier way. And what I do is once there is, and it, it, I, it happens randomly, when I find a, I read something that haunts me, that hits me and it, in my stomach or my brain, and it, it, it ignites the questions. I know that that's the story that it's speaking some, you know, that it's talking to my heart. What I do then is I spread all the elements that that fiction piece has from the author. And I try to recognize which of all those elements are crucial for me as an individual. They may be all of them, they may not be all of them. And once I find which are the lines that draw my heart, I pull them out of the context of the original form of storytelling, which may be a novella, a short story, a song, whatever it is. And I go to the very, very precise process of creating the backbone of my story. And I don't want to be rude, but I don't think that I would like to speak about the process of creating a backbone of a film in, in, in script writing because there are hundreds of books. Mm. Mm. That is something that you Google <laughs> and you're going to get it like this. For me, what it's, and, and that's something that anyone, much more with much better management of the language and with much more experience than me, would be much more enriching experience to ask somebody else in, in, in in terms of the specificity of the technique of, of creating a narrative structure for film. I just wanted to know what your process is. My process goes like that. And you know, once I find it can be a character, usually in my case, it happens through like subjects, themes. Mm -hmm. You know, the first, I can talk if you want if, about my, the most recent project in which was, I was involved, which was fascinating in that sense. There's, it's a beautiful, beautiful novella by Witi Himaera, and, the, and, and he deals with many, many interesting and complex subjects in his novella. Mm -hmm. The one that hit me in my stomach was the question of identity and the question of motherhood. They are both fundamental issues that I have as a human being that are not sorted out in my life as a human being. Mm -hmm. So. I pull from Witty's story those elements, and I went inside myself to my dark places, to my fundamental questions, to my unsolved territories, trying to find why those subjects burn inside of me, why they are keep, why they are not sorted out. And well, that was my personal journey, and of course, it is. Through each one of the characters, I have to all the time ask questions. So do you ask questions of the characters or through the characters? I ask questions going within the, within character, the character and think, I, I try to become the character. <coughs> and from within that character, I try, and that's a beautiful exercise of, on one side, imagination, and another side, and on the other side, it's a beautiful exercise of uniqueness and universality. Mm -hmm. Because the questions that may matter to me may be me, myself, and I. And that's not good enough to ask someone to invest $2 million in me, myself, and I. <laughs> you have to have a larger purpose. <coughs> and that is the exercise that I do as an author 
<coughs> I ask myself, is this an issue that will be important for somebody else beyond myself? If not, I go to therapy. <laughs> if I suspect that it may be important for somebody else, I go and I try to spread the story again and see what the story and, and, and the journey of each one of those characters will take me in the story of the medicine women, women which is, the, the, you know, it's not the final title, doesn't matter, there are three main characters. And the three of them inhabitate the conflict of identity from a totally different perspective. And the three of them go through the experience of motherhood in a totally different way. And my duty, if I want to be truthful as, as much as I can, is to become the three characters. I have to be them in order to speak from a truthful place. My characters will never be truthful if I don't undress myself and even skin myself. Is that what you yeah. say? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, yeah. peel my skin now. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever, you know, you understand what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, we know that. We're with you. We're with you. Yeah? <laughs> and get inside. And sometimes, you know, I can tell you that there was one character that I hated. I despised her. And it took me a big, big personal journey to find out why I, why I didn't like her. I wanted to take her out of the story. Did you discover why? Yes, I did. And is she still in the story? Oh, you know something? She became the most powerful and beautiful character of, all the film, yeah. of the whole film. And how and did you discover why? Because I went, you know, this is a process of four years. And I found that what I disliked and despised of her were my darkest secrets. My own personal struggle with my own identity were buried so under the most remote places of my soul. And she was speaking on them. So she was like, speaking hey. to you. She was speaking to my darkest places. And of course, I said, you know, you bitch. I don't want to deal with you. <laughs> and when I started recognizing the pain, the contradiction, the sorrow, the loss, that identity, or our, our unsolved identity can bring you, I started to understand her and to deeply love her. Can I just skip from being the storyteller to being the director for a minute? Because I think it's really special to have you reveal this extraordinary magical process. When you're on set, when you, when you cast and when you're working with the actors, do you go to a similar place? I mean, how does that being yes. the characters relate to you with your performance? I go, and I've been, you know, lucky enough to have to be able to do that. I go through a very, very intense workshop Mm -hmm. with the actors. You know, we do go to a very deep analysis of the original source, the adaptation. I talk like a parrot. I really bombard the actors with what I see and why I see it that way. And then together, because if, if, if that process doesn't happen within the actor, the magic on the screen will never happen. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, it is an invitation that I do to my actresses or actors to search if that story hooks within themselves. Yeah. Only if that hook happens, I'm sure that that is the right actor or right actress. If it doesn't happen, I cannot engage myself yeah. in creating the character. Yeah. You know? So we yeah. do work a lot together and we do search deeply in the emotional territory of the actor as an individual. You know, I don't push, and, and I always ask, are you comfortable? You know, I'm really quite respectful because I deal with extreme emotional stories usually. Yeah. So I'm mindful on the safety mm -hmm. of the people that I work with. But I do request an intense search, as intense as I, I went through. And do you, I mean, it's interesting, you, you're mindful of safety, but you know, pirates are charting dangerous waters, aren't they? Yes. That we wouldn't be out there on that ship. Yes. That may have a leak 
if we weren't in, if if we didn't get excited by danger. Yes, yes, and I do believe that if all the crew that you bring into that ship had the story of a pirate, <laughs> you will survive. And that is a little bit what I, the, the, the question and the offering that I ask. You know, I, I, I promise it an adventure, an intense, fascinating adventure. <coughs> Dangerous, yes, with uncertain result, results. Uh, we may drown. <laughs> you never know because every time you start a project, you really have no idea where it will take you as a filmmaker and where it will take you as a human being. Most of us, you know, emerge from a film like zombies, like totally, well, not totally, but mostly broken and uh, and depleted. And your vision is cloudy, isn't it, at the end of the well, day? Well, I Because you've been seeing yes. so much for so long, so yes. intensely. You go yeah. like with a heat stroke. Yeah. <laughs> from the <laughs> on the sea. You know, on your little boat, that's from the ship, it's a little boat at the end. But anyway, <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm answering the question of, of how I work with the actors. No, no, I just like thought that. it was kind of an interesting, because there are some writer directors in the room, so it's sort of interesting to you know, know a little bit about how mm. that process works. Too. I work very, very closely with my actors, and I work very, very closely as well. I try to work as close as it's possible with all the crew, and I like them, I, in, ideal, in an ideal world, I do really like everybody to read the script and to know the script. I work very, very, with a lot of detail in my script. It is, that is my map. My script is really, really my map. I, I describe what I see in my head. I just put it exactly how I see it on the page. So it can be really the reference for all the crew. So nobody get, gets, gets lost on the way. And if I get lost, which happens a lot under mm. the horrible pressure, and, mm. and even when there is no pressure, I get lost. And <laughs> if I know that my people, my crew, have the map, they will help me out and I rely on them. I rely, you know, in this fascinating, intensive process that was shooting the film here in New Zealand, I know that Alvo, who was the most exquisite DOP anybody could dream, was also my twin soul. You know, he was... Oh my God, what was that? Ricky, Ricky, very, 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 very Welcome. Great, great entrance. Yeah, great entrance. <laughs> um, so I knew that there were moments in which I was, you know, due to extreme circumstances of this specific production, there were moments that I had to rewrite my story while I was shooting. And there were moments that I was lost because I was writing what I had to shoot the next day while Albol was putting the lights for the scene that I had to shoot 10 minutes later. So my brain was jumping from, and not only my brain, my heart, was jumping from one place to the other, and I would come to the set, you know, with the eyes like this, <laughs> and I would look at Albol, and he knew the map. He knew the script. It was imprinted in his heart again, not in his brains, not in the uh, engineering of, of the light design. It was in his heart. And he would recognize that I was totally, you will excuse my French, fucked up. <laughs> and he would give me his hand and pull me out of my sense of droning and help me out to sort out the scene. That is a crew of pirates. Mm -hmm. So yes, we were in extreme situations. And yes, we could have drawn all of us right there. But you didn't. Well, we will, yes, no, we didn't draw. We brought the ship back, a little bit, you know, broken, but it's back on shore. What we still don't know if it's the treasure. How we see the treasure. That, you know, yeah. we have to wait until the film is finished, but then, um, you know, the screen. One of the things is to take you back. Um, you know, you're being very revealing and brave in this conversation, I think. So I, I'm going to ask you a a question that I, you know, I think we all grapple with, and you spoke about it before, but perhaps come at it in a different way, because it's hard to speak about. Mm. When you're doing bold, risky things and going on dangerous adventures, one of the elements, apart from success, that we all 
sleepless nights about is fear. Mm. Mm. And you spoke about, um, over that process of getting your map together, which was your screenplay, and getting into the heart of your story, where you had to, you know, the bitch that you hated <coughs> became the woman that was part, of, you recognised as part of your soul. How did you, how did you deal with that fear? Do you have any, is it just stoicism? Is it just going back in and laying, as you, as you do this one, you know, laying out the elements? Isn't that a useful kind of image? You know, you're sort of almost showing us a physical process. Is this something? I, I, you know, I, I think that that process happens during the script writing. Yeah, that's what I'm going back to that. Yeah. And that, you know, what I do, when I do that, I'm in the beautiful safety of my house in my nightmares at night. Yeah. So I'm exposed to my own places, mm -hmm. the beautiful ones and the horrible ones, in a contained place, in a safe place, which is home. Yeah. Even if in home at night, the, the night is gone. So it is, I guess that, you know, I'm sure that they are places that I'm afraid but I don't stop. I don't stop. I, it, it, it is, I'm, I'm, I have to say that I, it's a very, very lucky characteristic that I have, <coughs> which is I, there is a place that I'm still a teenager. You know, teenagers don't have any reference of danger, right? They get drunk and say, fuck, nothing will happen to me. <laughs> or the drug, nothing will happen to me. I do have a little bit of that in mm. my system. and. If I'm afraid, I don't give too much attention to it. I'm more afraid, you know, in the panic attack of shooting and say, oh my God, what am I going to do now in order to bring the story that I'm seeing that it's flying away from me? There's another stage in the storytelling process, which is inspiring other people about your story, mm. which is a, a big part of filmmaking, not just your soulmates who are there with you every day as you make it, but your investors and your sort of intellectual supporters, if you like, mm -hmm. and people who, um, even if we're looking at, I mean, as we are this weekend, being challenged and stimulated to look at new models of filmmaking and how we own our work and present it and share it with audiences and build communities and culture, but people who want to ex exploit your story and make money out of it. You know, we talk about that because this heart mm. is very important and it's challenged, isn't it? Yes, we spoke about you know mm. the, the, the terrible paradox of, of working with your heart in a heartless industry, mm. you know, which is what we do. <laughs> and um, I'm aware of it, I know that that is the fact, and I. You know, I do know, and it, 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 I invite you to all the storytellers that may be in this room. When you start writing, when you have the wish and the dream of seeing your story on the screen, on the screen, you will scream as well, but anyway, on the screen. <laughs> don't think about the money people. Fuck them. We are not, uh, if you start thinking on how the m people will make money with your story, you haven't even started telling your story. And it may sound selfish, unreal, it is. It is selfish, it is unreal, but it's from the only place where you can hold your story to the end. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if you, at the end of the long journey, are able to place your heart on the paper, the heart of the readers, being producers or bank people or the New Zealand Film Commission or whoever will be, will palpitate. Yeah. Which is the beautiful miracle of what we do. When you go through your own fear, beautiful, dark, light places at home writing in search of your heart, it end, and you go through that process with courage and discipline. And skill. I mean, you've got skills. Well, you, well that's something that, that you can develop, right? Exactly. Yeah. The other yeah. one is a choice. Yeah. 
That's right. I'm sh I, at least I've been lucky enough that when that has happened, I see the palpitating heart of the people, and then they jump in the project. And um, yeah, if I would be thinking, the cinema has been kidnapped by marketing. Mm. Executives end up having a say on storytelling. Mm. That's not their job. Mm. Their job is to provide a storyteller with all the elements that the storyteller needs to put that story on the screen. That's their job. They have nothing to say about editing, casting. They should be the director or the writer if that's what they want to do. Otherwise, they would stick to their job. And I think that it's an important thing for all storytellers to be almost like guerrilla fighters and not give up that right. Because once those people start putting their hands in your story and manipulating it, it's lost. And you start negotiating. And you start giving concessions. And at the end of the journey, you cannot survive your loss. I think that that's where the integrity of the pirate, pirate mm -hmm. lies, lies, lives, yeah. dwells. Yeah. And it's a, you know, it is a horribly difficult battle. And you may lose your arm, and you may lose an eye, and, but you have to fight. I do refuse to let the people who have the money but don't have the heart in the storytelling way, you know, <clears throat> to manipulate it. I don't deal with their money. I don't want them to deal with my story. You know, I don't tell them where they have to put from which, but no. <laughs> don't, and it's important. It's important if you hold the integrity of your story, then the possibility of coming back with a treasure and making the audience shiver may happen. Do you think one of the strengths, I mean, you speak of adaptation, um, which, when, which we'll talk about later on today, so I don't want to get into it too much, but when, when you are an adapter as a storyteller, um, there is something outside of you right from the beginning. There is another... You know, there is another artist's voice or a, or a song or an article or whatever it is, a, a real-life situation. Something will pre-exist your connection with the material. I think there's a different process when it is an original story, when, when the artist is, is going into the deep mystery of themselves, not knowing, well, not, not, not having these elements that you can, mm -hmm. right from the beginning, look at and always go back to and they are unchanging. Have you ever made a film from an original yes, story? Yes, I did and I have to tell you that until now I will not count The Medicine Woman because it's not finished yet but it's the film that I love the most mm. and it's a film that started from an image I saw 4 o'clock in the morning I was in a cafe depressing cafe in Mexico City and I saw a man, a very poor man walking to his work, on the way to his work. And I thought, this man, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. He just woke up. He's going to take a bus that's going to take him two, three hours to cross the bloody city, to work in a semi-slavery condition, mm -hmm. to earn the most basic amount of money, go back, sleep, and next day mm -hmm. it's going to be the same. And the feeling of Again, it hit my heart. It was a sorrow that I felt, thinking M Mexican people, we do have an intense, I don't know the word in English, but you know, sacrifice is ingrained in our system. And what a terrible quality to have. And that's the feeling that I had when I saw this man. And from the idea of sacrifice and a destiny that, that cannot be changed, those were the two elements right. that allowed me to create a story of a girl who lives in a circus. 
which has nothing to do with the man who was working, going to work, but the character who sacrificed, who is being sacrificed in order to be redeemed, was the symbol of that this man. man walking to catch his boss. What's the name of this man? The Angel of Fire. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kim? Yeah. Can I ask about um, handling, handling the heart on? So is it, and it's, is it, it's, it's a story that comes from your heart, and then you hand maybe that heart onto the character, and then you want that heart to go onto the audience. Do you sometimes find that if you invest so much of your own, you know, it maybe comes from you, but it's not, it's not a story about you, it's a story about these characters. Mm -hmm. So do you find it hard or do you sometimes have to pull back yourself in the writing process, I guess, to remember that it's, although it's coming from your heart and now it's these characters that you've created and you sort of have to pull back? Because you invest so much in it, but at some stage do you, yeah. It's, you know something, what happens to me, and you know, it's, it's again, it's a personal process. Mm -hmm. and that's from the only place where I can talk. I don't pull back. Mm -hmm. The only moment when I pull back is when I hand the, the story to the actors. Mm -hmm. And then, although I'm kind of a little bit of a control freak, <laughs> I, uh, I, I do honor how that the alchemy, the internal alchemy that happens within an actor, mm -hmm. because they bring some, you know, they have revealed in the experience that I had, which is not much, but it has been quite intense. Every time, one or two or three or the whole cast will bring me amazing gifts mm -hmm. in terms of how they reinterpret and inhabit mm -hmm. the piece of the heart that I lend them. They really take over and transform it, and it is, it is it's a gift. And you know, it has happened in many places, and then it's when I say, wow, I was not expecting this. I never even dreamt about it, but thank you so much, and it makes perfectly sense with the structure of the character that I gave you. Mm -hmm. So that's when I pull back, but when I'm writing, I go all the way. Yeah. I, I, I love how the Mexican culture definitely uh, enriches your, your storytelling. How much is it on a dialogue writing basis that you feel challenged on with the two languages? Do you, um, how do you deal? In which language do you write and do you oh. get translated? <laughs> That's a big story. You know, I wrote in Spanish this script. I, you know, the original is, is Witties in English. I wrote the script in Spanish. Then we had, among them, my beautiful daughter helping me <laughs> to translate it. <laughs> and then we translated it into Tuhoi, Tereo. So we went, in, in, the, in the case of this specific film, the, the language, the dialogue, went through a beautiful breaching of cultures. And at the end of the day, you know, for example, I wouldn't be able to create dialogues in English because my management of the language is not so precise. I, I can kneel very well the dialogues in Spanish and then I have to find someone <coughs> who relates to his own language in the same way that I relate to mine. And I work strongly in the dialogues from Spanish to English and then I, I was lucky enough to find an amazing, amazing, creative, intelligent, wonderful woman who is a filmmaker from the Tuho Iwi. And she took the script, she worked on it, and then we went to the old medicine woman in her town to make sure that that dialogue referred exactly to what that woman would relate to. That's huge. That's it was a it's beautiful a process. Journey, it but was it has different, absolutely different stories from in every language. You know, they sound in a different way, but I, I don't speak Tereo. Mm. Now, when we've been editing the film, there is something which is, for me, it was beautiful to discover. And again, it's like a bloody cliche, but the heart is there. Mm -hmm. And the sound of the language, no matter which language it is, it's the, it sings 
the same song, right? And I hear the dialogue in Tereo, and I don't understand the specificity of the meaning word by word. But the emotional journey of each one of the dialogues that I wrote in Spanish, coming from Witty, is still there. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, again a discovery of universality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you try different people, or how did you find uh, like agency, or just asking your Anna if I have uh, you know, a heart to get a translator? That's still a storyteller. Of course, of course. I yes. So maybe, you, you know, I, I had the, I was lucky because in Mexico we shoot in Spanish, and we are such a tiny industry that if you want to promote your film, you have to always translate it into English, mm -hmm. subtitle it. So in the previous films that I made, I already had an amazing translator, an English-speaking guy who knows perfectly Spanish. So he was subtitling my previous films. So he knew my work, he knows my culture, he knows where I come from, and he was the, the guy who first translated the script, the whole script. And then, you know, there were all the things that um, were twitched here and there. Of course, that was California English, and then it had to be swapped to Kiwi English. And in the case of Tereo, I absolutely, you know, it, bringing this film to, you know, this film was possible only because the people in Ruatacuna, which is the place where we shot, and where the identity of this story sits, they, they, they wanted the film to happen. They participate in the creative process of this film. So I, I trusted, you know, it's not even that I trusted. It belonged to them. They hold the integrity of the language. I was the one to be trusted, and I promise them that their language would be honored word by word. And the only way to do that was to give them the script so they would translate it word by word. And, and it was a whole process. One of the major things for me was to honor the language in this specific film. And there is a heart in the language. Isn't Oof. It? Yeah. It is. It's beautiful because it is, it's powerful. It's, and it works with sense of humor and depth. And the language, at the end of the day, speaks of the cosmogony of each culture. Mm -hmm. We all relate to the world the way we describe it. Speaks of who we are and where we come from and how we understand the world. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and it was beautiful to see how my language from Spanish-Mexican was transformed, and, and again, like an alchemy thing, into a different vision of the universe, just through the language. It was a privilege as, 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 as a storyteller to, to participate in that. And it, 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 was, it didn't belong to me. It was not a process that I hold on to. It belonged to them. Yeah? yeah? You know? yeah and, that, and maybe in all the films, you let the actors bring in their own language? Well, I work very strongly with my dialogues. And I do rehearse a lot with the actors before shooting. And if there are some words that they don't sit, we can work on them. In, in Spanish, it's much easier for me because I know that once the dialogue is there, it's because I worked on it for one year, maybe. Here in English, I was trusting a lot my actresses to say, well, does it make sense to you? Do you feel comfortable? No. You want to change it only when we were dealing in English. When we were dealing in Tereo, we couldn't change a word because it was already a process that was new. Mm -hmm. So two questions, one here and one here. So did you have a question at all? No, oh, right. Hi. You spoke about telling stories from the heart, about writing scripts which mean something to you on a personal level. But when you have such strong opinions on politics, on globalization and that kind of things, it's bound to upset a lot of people. Yeah. So how do you deal with negative feedback or when your work is not appreciated enough? You know, you deal with it in the same way that you, you know, it's like you ask me, 
how will you fall in love if you may end up breaking up? Well, shit happens. <laughs> you have to go through the situation, and of course it will have, and I, I will not say that you know I'm happy when nobody likes my films. It hurts. But I have to take the risk. I'd rather upset and deal with going back home saying, oh my god, nobody loves me, mm -hmm. than telling a story that I don't believe in it. That's why I don't do too many films. And I'm happy with that. I don't want to accumulate hours like pilots. And I don't say that that's the way for everybody. That's the way that works for me. And they are amazing, beautiful, fascinating films made by filmmakers that they just convey a story without putting themselves through the process. And I see them enjoy or learn. That's not my way and I cannot fight it. You know, I did it once and I, don't, I was not a happy person and I, I am not proud of that film. And I don't want to go there again. I rather deal with people saying, I don't like it. Or, and you know, sometimes when people don't like the film, it's a process, but you have to learn to listen. And say, well, it's may, it may not be that I am not appreciated. It may be that I was not able to convey. And why? Which were my failures? And I go back to one of the questions. Did I hold on so much that it stayed an enclosed, codified universe that nobody could understand? Maybe. You know, but that's something that you learn with age and with rejection. You have to survive it and learn from it, I guess. But it's painful, of course, because you expose yourself there. And we all like to be liked. Yeah, am I answering you? So just don't care too much about what the audience thinks. No, it's not the audience. I guess that the audience, I don't, if I believe in my story, and I speak from what I believe that it's truth, I hope that it will reach the people. If I move them, I'm happy. They may not agree with, the, my, with my position, but if I move them in any way, I'm happy. And if they don't like the film, well, I have to, some people may like this t-shirt, some others, no. And you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I can, even if I wish, make something that will please everybody. I mean, I would, <laughs> I don't know, why would be Spielberg, but I don't know. Yeah. Hang on, the, right, here and then there's lots. <laughs> Question time. I just want to say very quickly that you know what you're saying is what just the process that you're talking about is an extremely moving. You're just listening to it. It's it's physical, the way you work and the way you articulate your work. But there's a tiny part of me that can't help thinking that what happens when you're as as I am that we write and we hand over to a director. This lovely position that you're talking about is your process that you carry through um, to the set. It, that, that vision of, of a very personal journey of holding on to something. And there's a tiny part of me that's wondering, I don't think your process would change if you were not directing your own work. I still believe absolutely that you would write the way you do. Um, but what would that negotiation be? Have you thought about that? Yes, I thought about it because, you know, right now <coughs> I question if I, if I have the strength to make another adventure, you know? I'm, I don't know if we want to make another film or not, but I love writing. And I cannot tell you because I haven't gone through that process. I've been investigating, investigating it in my head and in my heart. And I guess that it will, ha if it happens, it will have to be an exercise of letting go, which is, again, what motherhood is teaching me. I am a mother, I adore my kids, but she is becoming a person of her own. And if I have, if I want to honor that beauty, I have to play <laughs> and play and let her fly. You know, I don't think that it's a process that may be easy. But it has, well, if it happened, I would just have to deal with the fact that if I, I will respect the director, and it would be, you know, it, it, I've never done it, and, and, and it would be quite fascinating for me to see how 
another human being sees that and just be an observant of a privileged process because we all are privileged people. Anything that happens in our life, professional life, as terrible and difficult and painful as it may be, we are part of a privileged tribe. We are not cleaning toilets, we are not sweeping the floors on the street. You know, we are part of a beautiful profession, so. Okay, yeah, then I, I have lots of questions over here, yes. Hi, thanks, thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, opportunity, I guess, is a session sponsored by WIF. Um, if you could talk a little bit to um, the woman's journey and the story, um, and do you think you know the difference, uh, the difference between the male journey and the female journey? Um, there was a proposition that the female's journey is to find home, or perhaps to be at home in themselves, um, and you particularly, you know, make the difference about woman, so if you could speak a little bit towards the woman or the heroine's journey and storytelling, or myth, yeah. myth and archetypes, and what are we trying to figure out as modern woman and... You know something, modern. to be honest, I don't go very much to that place in such a structured, uh, rational scheme. I am 52, and that discussion happened in my country 30 years ago. And I participated in it, sometimes from the opposition, trying to find a voice, a voice as an individual beyond my, ge my how do you say that? Ge gender. 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 Um, without missing the point that, yes, we do go through life as individuals from different places. Just the fact that we have a I different structure of the about body. The characters and your stories. The, the well, you know something, I do work, again, I can only, I, 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 probably it's just a natural thing for me to speak, as I was say, saying before, you know, motherhood, it's something that it's an integral experience of my life and a powerful one, not only as a mother, also as a daughter and as a granddaughter. Um, but for example, if I think on, on the question of identity, Colonization is a phenomenon mm -hmm. yeah, that happens no matter where and to whom. Mm -hmm. It follows the same horrible dynamics. And if I, if I will go through that experience, I don't go there from the specificity of my femininity. I revise the experience of it, how I see it and how I feel it in my skin, and in the way I think and the education that I got and what I lost and what I gained. Having said that, I can, I can, I can only surprise myself every time seeing that the films that I do happen to women. You know, it's really beautiful in this film, only girls. The only male character that is an active character is the Coro, which um, who is a profound force in the film, appears in one scene, and an absent husband. And the rest of the universe is women and moved by three women. I feel comfortable there. I don't know if I would be a man how my films would work. I'm not, so mm. I don't know if I'm being able to answer your question. talking about the, the, the heroine's journey and Woman in film, woman the way um, portrayed on screen, like is the hero's journey, is it an internal one, is the hero's journey the more the outward, the really the big doing stuff and, and you talk about in your film, the woman going into the womb and, and going to those dark places. Is it a more internal journey for a woman? I think as a filmmaker, you're challenged to make an internal journey, an external journey, because we yeah. see people yeah. on screen doing things. Um, I mean read Witty's story and then go and see yeah. Dana's film and you'll mm. have a wonderful insight from the discussion today about how she's gone on that journey with those characters, I think, because it's, um, I, think that, I think that will answer a whole lot of your questions. I'm sorry, sorry can I answer you more precisely? Yeah. 
There was another. Okay, yeah. You spoke before about the script being your map yes. in your film work and in your documentary film work. Is this so? You know something, I don't have that much experience as a documentary filmmaker. I made one, which is the story that I told you at the beginning about this uh, woman in Mexico. And at the time, I didn't have at all a map. Mm. I just went and asked. And I asked children, neighbors, and of course, I had at the time kind of a backbone <coughs> how I wanted to tell the story of this woman. And that would have been like a map. But of course, reality is like water. It goes away. And the backbone of that film, or the map, was supposed to sit in an interview with this woman, Elvira, was, is her name, the woman who was accused of killing her children. And at the end of the day, she decided that she was not going to give me the interview not because she mistrusted me, but her, the, the I, I'm sorry I lose the, the, the language, the resolution of the process was just about to happen. And she was gambling with her life. You know, it was perpetuity in, in, in jail, which is what we have in Mexico, like the highest penalty. So she said anything that I would say now publicly could be devastating. So all of a sudden I thought, well, my beautiful backbone, my map, is gone. <clears throat> and I was just like following the voice of all the people around her, and they told the story. But I didn't, you know, my map didn't work. <laughs> I was, for, well, I will not, you know, they are, I have other experience in documentaries, but I was producing, I was not directing. And in those experiences, I absolutely, respected the journey of the director. I didn't even, you know, nothing. So it's very, very restricted my experience in documentary, so I, I wouldn't be able to say more. Yeah. You had a question before, has it gone away? Or no, I've still got it. Um, I'll just give it. It's quite a big one, but if you could just briefly sort of explain um, how uh, you get what you've done into post-production and sort of the process that you take once it's <coughs> been filmed. Can you just be a little bit more specific? Yeah. yeah. How do you work with your editor? <laughs> well, again, I, I tend to be quite uh, controlling. And I've been learning little by, yes, it is, that's the way. You know, I like to cut by the frame that I want because I know that, that, that and I press, and I sit on the back of the poor editor and, and exploit him. <laughs> yes, it is, it is so, and sometimes, you know, I, I see the guy saying, well, I have a voice, I have a voice, please hear it. <laughs> Shut up, I'm the director, I know it has got, and I, in, this, in this film, I learned, <coughs> listen, I like, to be honest, uh, I mean, being honestly, I like to have the final cut. Mm. I'm very obsessive, I should knowing where I want to cut when I, you know, when I'm not lost. <laughs> uh, so I, I tend to be very, very um, controlling. Uh, I guess that they are people who have the amazing, beautiful luck to find the perfect editor, and then a dialogue happens. It's not my case, so, yeah. Yes? No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, right, and then after, sorry. I'm um, just listening to you, Dana, um, and looking at the title of the session today the, about the heart. Um, just listening to you, I, I hear you talking about two different hearts. There's the anatomical heart, the physical heart, that provides that functions, hopefully involuntarily, that gets the blood to the provides the oxygen for the intellect of the story, that provides the blood to give the story its energy and movement and all the other functions. So the purely functional heart of the story. And you talk also about the emotional, um, thematic maybe, heart of the story. 
which serves which, and when you've found the emotional <coughs> part, I don't know whether I can frame it, but when does the craft kick in? You know, in my case, because I tend to be very chaotic in my head, <coughs> I, 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 I hold strongly the engineering mechanism of the beautiful heart, which it's very fascinating because my father, who is present here, he's a cardiologist. Uh -huh. So I heard about the beauty. <laughs> yes, yes, it's not by coincidence. It's really like a very, very beautiful thing. <laughs> and I heard about this beautiful machinery since, was, since, since I can remember. That fascinating mythological yeah. machine described by my father when we were having dinner or lunch <laughs> has been present in my life. So I know that in order to make it pump, as you say, it requires precision, effectiveness. And each piece is there for a reason. There is nothing by chance or just because it looks nice. So I do hold very, very strongly to the structure of my story, and I revise it, and I revise it many times. And having said that, that doesn't mean that I get it right, but in what I call Dana land, it works, <laughs> right? And if, if I don't hold into that place, which is a very fascinating question, because I tend to fly away and oh, I, I end up who knows where, and I have to drag it back and say, is this chamber of the heart beating at the right rhythm to send the blood to the other chamber? And I revise the structure of my story in a very, very pragmatic and basic paradigm of, of script writing. Yeah. And that's a discipline that I have to impose on myself to control my chaos, mm -hmm. yes? And it is, it's a joy for me. You know, when I see that the things land in the right place, at least in, on paper, or on editing, or with the music, I said, the heart is alive. Great. Yes? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, when we read about Mexico in our press, most often it is about the drug mm. you know, I'm wrestling with a story which is about, I think, the heart of racism in New Zealand. You may not know that until recently we had the highest rate of convictions for possession of marijuana in the world, and well over half of those convictions are Maori. Now, in Mexico, we know that the US has put guns down there, and these cartels have killed thousands of people, including many of the most famous singers. I want to know, is anyone trying to tell that story in Mexico? Oh, yeah. And is that a difficult story to tell? Yes. First of all, yes, they are a lot of people still, you know, we in Mexico have a long tradition of having a very political cinema since the very beginning. The, um, yeah, we'll all not go to the history of Mexican cinema, but it's really yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but we are a very, very political cinema people. So yes, there have been a lot of people dealing with it <coughs> from different places, from a dark black comedy, brilliant film by the son of my teacher, the dog. Um, his son, what was the name of this film? Luis Estrada is the name of the director. And the name of the film, oof. We can ask Mr. Google. No, that's that's yes, yes. It's, just remember, it's Luis Estrada, he's the name of the, the director, and I will remember the title. But anyway, he made a very black, black and dark comedy about the horrors of the narco cartel and the horrible corruption, corruption of the state pretending to make a war against the cartel. At the end of the day, they are the same people, oh, right? Just profiting through arms and drug of the misery of my country. But that's another story. They are a lot of people doing that in Mexico, from documentary. And of course, it's a very, very dangerous option. Uh, you know, 
a dear, dearest friend of mine when I was a younger, she had to flee the country just a month ago because she has been um, threatened to be chopped in pieces. So yes, it is a rough, horrible reality. Do you think it will ever change unless US policy changes? No, I don't think that it will. It's, I think that it takes way much more. But I think that that's another discussion, which sure. is the politics thank of Mexico. But yeah, thank yeah, thank you. <laughs> One last question. A knuckle or here at slow? A knuckle. A knuckle. Here at slow? Sorry? Here at slow? No, that's a, that's a previous one, mm. Hero de Slo, the next one. El Naco, no? Uh, how? El Naco o Un Mundo Maravilloso? Un Mundo Maravilloso. Yeah, okay. yeah. thank that's you. Last question. Um, the dark places. Mm. Just um, how do you find work again? How do you find, you know, tapping into those deep questions inside yourself? Do you get lost mm. in there? And when you are lost in there, can you feed off, how do you feed off that and turn that into creative, a creative process? Yes, that, of course true? I do. Yes, you know, I, I, we all, I think that at the end of the day, what happens to me, it's, it's, it's exactly what happens to all of us. It's just what we do with it. Mm. I get lost in the same way that probably you get lost. And many times I don't find my way out. And there are many dark places that I haven't found yet and probably will not find my way out. And some of them I'm afraid and I'm, I may go 10 minutes before I die or in next life or who knows, right? I can tell you that in the creative place specifically, in this film for example, the film that I just I, I'm, I'm finishing. There were so many moments that I was really drowning. And the only thing that kept me clear and going was I made a promise to the people who trust me that I was going to defend the integrity of this film. And that was my mantra. And I would wake up in the morning saying, fuck, I want to go back to Mexico, put myself under the blanket and disappear <laughs> from two for South Pacific pictures, New Zealand. You know, I just don't want to be the person that I am right now. And I remember that I made a promise and that that promise had to be honored. That was my resource in that specific moment. I guess at each moment in life, and depending on which are the circumstances and the quality and the conditions of the darkness, always holds the little hook to pull you out. You just have to make sure. And, and then in channeling those questions and you know those questions that you find in those spaces of the characters. Sorry, I didn't. Ch understand. Channeling those questions that, and, and they and in, in your soul and into your characters. I mean, you're kind of talking about how you do that that the person that you hated the most became, you know, your most loved <coughs> character. Was that kind of stuff in yourself that you, you know, that you, that you, that you felt? Well, you know, it, I, I, it happened to be at the end of the day like an exorcism, as I was telling at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. By going through that process and researching that, I understood many things of myself. And they may still be there, but acknowledging their existence gave some fresh air, like when you pull out the band-aid, yeah. well, the wound is there, but at least it heals a little bit better. Yeah? Yeah. It's a big question to end on, but we do need to stop. Thank you, Dana, very, very much.